this is fantastic. I mean, this is uh, first time in like two and a half years presenting in front of people. That's kind of nice. Uh, and I mean, this is great. This is a great opportunity to meet the early career scientists. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to provide a presentation on safety and effectiveness of pharmacological ADHD treatment. So if uh, saying started off in a quite general way, I will be more specific and talk about results. I will be quite uh, self-centered, uh, presenting a lot of uh, a lot of results that we have uh, presented in the past, published papers, uh, and I hope that we can use that as a as a basis for for discussion of things that is relevant for time, time span and the research that we will conduct within time span uh, for the coming years. This relates a lot to what Seng talked about. So randomized controlled trials uh, have demonstrated that ADHD medication do have beneficial effects on ADHD symptoms. But RCTs, randomized controlled trials, have been less Inform informative when it comes to real world consequences, when it comes to questions around effectiveness of ADHD medication. And that includes both short term benefits, short term risks, as well as long term effects. And the reason for this is that RCTs uh, often exclude the most interesting patients. You heard it from Seng and you heard it here again. This is a really strong argument for the research that we are doing. RCTs are great, but they do have limitations and uh, real world data that we use can be used as a complement. Uh, it can be used to ask questions around uh, real patients. Another concern when it comes to RCTs is that they are typically, I mean, they are very expensive. Uh, so they are typically based on small uh, numbers. Uh, so they are, uh, they often lack statistical power. If you're interested in serious, uh, harmful and rare events. And also finally, they uh, quite often have a quite short follow-up period. So it's difficult to address long-term outcomes when you are in the RCT situation. So as you can see here, this, the, the limitations of uh, the RCT design is uh, most often the strength of the pharmacoepidemiological approach. So when we do pharmacoepi research, we typically have access to very large sample sizes. We have a long uh, time scale, scale when it comes to follow up. And we often have information about very important outcomes. Criminality, accidents, suicidal behavior, etc. And these outcomes are difficult to study in an RCT setting. So the goal of this uh, presentation is to uh, present results around short-term benefits, such as criminality, accidents, injuries, as well as short-term risks, suicidal behavior, substance abuse, mania, etc. A second goal is to initiate a discussion around strength and limitations of pharmacoepidemiological research and try to highlight remaining knowledge gaps and also uh, ongoing research. And what you see here is the paper that was sent around prior to this meeting. So we wrote that a couple of years ago and the presentation, my short presentation builds on that to a large, large extent. So if you have read that one, you, you will most probably be familiar with most of what I will present on. 
In Sweden, as well as in many other countries, it's possible to link uh, national registers. We have done that and we have uh, conducted research on such big data record linkages. We have one uh, large one that contains more than 30 registers. The most important registers are probably the patient register, the prescribed drug register, and the cause of death registers. Uh, and we use them when we design our studies, and we have used them when we address questions around ADHD medication. So typically we use the total population register and the medical birth register and or to, to identify a relevant study cohort. We identify with individuals with a diagnosis of ADHD from the national patient register. We obtain information about ADHD medication status from the national prescribed drug register. And we use that information to assign on and off treatment periods across time for, uh, for all individuals that we study. And we typically do that using a gapped approach where we uh, allow six or three, uh, six or a three month gap between two prescriptions to decide whether they are on treatment or not. I want to highlight that we recently, uh, in work led by Le and Seng, have come up with a slightly di different approach for assigning uh, treatment duration and treatment discontinuity. And that is something that we will try to use uh, within the project of time span. But to, put, uh, to keep it simple, we use register-based data from the National Prescribed Drug Register to map or decide whether uh, an individual is on treatment or not. And that allows us to study the effectiveness of ADHD medication on important outcomes. Seng introduced uh, the concept or the design within individual designs, which is uh, a neat design. It helps us to reduce or adjust for some aspects of confounding, which is super important. So the, the basic thing here is that we compare individuals during treatment and non-treatment periods to see whether there are increased rates of the outcome that we're interested in. And this is possible in relation to ADHD because individuals with ADHD, they initiate ADHD medication treatment. There is a high tendency to stop and there is a tendency to restart again. So individuals with ADHD tend to fluctuate in their ADHD treatment status over time. And we make use of that and basically compare whether the rate of an outcome is more common during treatment periods compared to non-treatment periods. So we have already conducted quite a few studies. I said, I warned you, I will be quite self-centered. Uh, we have studied many different outcomes and we have used several different uh, registers to obtain uh, information about those outcomes. So we have conducted studies on criminality, accidents, seizures, mania, injuries, etc. So let's look at some results. So uh, what I would like to start off with is recent results. Uh, if it's okay with recent meaning I mean, I actually noticed that our first pharmacoepi study on ADHD medication uh, was conducted 10 years ago. So that's not super recent, but um, for the past 10 years, we have explored short-term benefits related to ADHD medication. And we have looked at uh, criminality, 
accidents and injuries, to mention a few. So what you see in this figure is results from a within individual comparison. So we have, as I explained, we have compared the rate of an outcome, criminality in this case, during treatment versus non-treatment periods. If you see a hazard ratio below one, it indicates that there is a lower rate of criminality during uh, treatment periods compared to non-treatment periods. And as you can see here, in two different uh, papers, now in one paper, males and females separately, we see that the rate of criminality is lower during ADHD medication treatment periods. We see similar results from a study conducted by Laura, who's in the audience, and we see similar results also from a recent, uh, not a recent, from an earlier study by Seng on motor vehicle accidents. Would you agree to that interpretation or do you see something that sticks out in this figure? Would you agree that we overall see that ADHD medication, the rate of criminality, accidents and injuries is lower during treatment periods compared to non-treatment periods? Sorry? In the, the effect size for female yeah, regarding motor vehicle accidents. Correct. Right. Yeah, it, it stands out as, as uh, something interesting. So uh, that was what we found in, in that first study. My interpretation of that number is, or that study is that ADHD medication is associated with lower rates of accidents in males. We are still, from this study, uncertain what the results look like uh, in females. And I use the term uncertain because here's the point estimate that if you have a look at the confidence intervals for females, it's huge. So it goes from, from below one to uh, almost an eight time increased rate of uh, excellence. So after this study, we left it as quite open. We don't really know how it works in females. But since that study, we have, uh, we have done additional studies using data from uh, US data. And there we see a very robust finding with very similar results for both males and females. So that's a nice example of, I mean, you present the results in a transparent and clear way. You interpret carefully. You are open that we are uncertain about the results in females. And then you do additional studies to explore whether uh, that conclusion holds or not. And with additional studies, it seems like the effect is quite the association is, is quite similar in males and females. Yeah. If I can. Yeah, sure. So in this case, was the problem, um, or not the problem, but could one interpretation be that in the Swedish sample, in the Swedish population, maybe there's like too few women who are diagnosed with ADHD or like receiving ADHD medication and also maybe females are just guessing less likely to get involved in motor vehicle accidents so the uncertainty comes from like smaller sample I mean not necessarily from differences between Sweden and the US right but just that the US maybe was larger sample correct and it should, yeah, so you're right on both. I mean, ADHD diagnosis and treatment uh, at the time point for that study, yeah. uh, I mean, it was um, less common in females. So, so when we conducted this study, we actually used, we based it on data 
between 2006 and 2009, if I rem remember correctly, and gender differences with regard to prevalence of ADHD in the Swedish population was more substantial. If we would redo the study now, I would uh, predict that it would look quite differently. Good point, thanks. Other comments on this slide? So let's turn to short-term risks. Is that clear? I mean, uh, maybe it's not, uh, and it's not, I mean, I think it's quite important. But if you notice that here we are talking about short-term benefits, and here we are talking about short-term risks, is that an important distinction to do? Or is it a study on ADHD medication and substance abuse could be viewed as a study on short-term benefits? Would you agree to that? Why is there a distinction between, between, between these two? Can I ask? Yes. Have you uh, made the distinction after the fact, after the result is in? <laughs> or, uh, I mean, I think we made the distinction in re retrospect. Yes. <laughs> yes. So when we when we published and wrote the review article, we sat down and we thought about it. It was not always in retrospect because it is like this. When we conducted the study on suicidal behavior. Our main worry was, is ADHD medication in, uh, associated with an increased risk of suicidal behavior? There is an FDA warning around it. There is a clinical worry that ADHD medication could introduce uh, suicidal ideation and potentially different types of suicidal behavior. So the question was, the clinical worry was about an increased risk. The same is true for substance uh, use problems, substance abuse. Clinicians are super worried about, not super worried, uh, some clinicians are um, a bit worried and also other uh, researchers are a bit worried about the potential association between ADHD medication and an increased risk of substance use problems. And the same goes for seizures and mania. So there is a clinical worry about an increased risk. So that's why we sort of made this uh, distinction between short-term risk and short-term benefits. And I, I can provide an example of how it sounds when, when, uh, when you present uh, study results uh, from studies about short-term risks. So here again, our results. Uh, results regarding suicidal behavior, substance abuse, seizures, and mania. And as you can see, point estimates below one indicate a reduced rate, point, uh, point estimates above one indicate an increased rate. So what our studies indicate is that ADHD medication is not associated with increased uh, risk or rate for these outcomes. So that is the interpretation of, that's the main interpretation. And then of course, we typically say that if anything, it might be associated with rich, reduced risk of these outcomes. But the main take home message is, we don't see estimates up here. So our data does not support uh, short-term risks in relation to this. Uh, the study on mania requires some additional uh, comments. So here in this study, we actually explored the risk of mania when ADHD medication was introduced in people with a co-occurring co bipolar disorder. And then we stratified on whether they were on a mood stabilization medication or not. Yes or no? And what we saw in this study, which was quite interesting, was that when ADHD medication was uh, prescribed to people with a bipolar disorder and with the, without any mood st stabilizing medication, we actually saw an increased uh, risk of mania. 
In contrast, when ADHD medication was prescribed and when there was a mode stabilizer in the background, we see no evidence of an increased risk. If anything, we see a lower rate of mania. So the basic take home message is that in the context of bipolar disorder, be a bit careful uh, with ADHD medication. Uh, make sure that uh, they are, the individuals are stabilized or, or stable by using a mood stabilizer when you introduce ADHD medication. So that's sort of the take home message with, for the study on mania. Here's a quite recent study. I don't want to talk too much about this one, but I want to highlight that we in recent studies have used slightly different designs compared to what we initially do. So in many of the more recent studies that we have conducted, we center quite a lot on uh, ADHD medication treatment initiation. So we center on this period. We identify the period where people with ADHD start their ADHD medication. And then we compare two critical periods to compare is the period directly after and directly before. And this is quite consistent with um, the Kenneth Mann approach and the Ian Wong approach. Uh, so we are sort of using a similar approach that has been used by others in the field. So in this specific study, when we compare period two and three, which was the period just before and after, in this study, which I would classify as a study about short-term risk, we see limited evidence of an increased risk of psychosis. And that is true both for individuals with the a history of psychosis, and it's also true for individuals without the history of psychosis. So this is no evidence for increased risk for psychosis. That's the take home message of this study. So if I would sort of summarize in broad terms where we are with regard to short term benefits and risks, I would say that we overall see that there are several short-term benefits and I would claim that we don't find evidence of short-term risks. If you have read the paper, the biological psychiatry review paper, we highlight that, I mean, much, much more research is needed on this topic. There are few replication studies and I think that that will and or has to some extent uh, changed. Uh, we need to see more systematic reviews and meta-analysis to sort of understand what the overall picture looks like. I think Seng indicated that we need to uh, move towards uh, smaller subgroups. It's, it's a great start to look at what effect does ADHD medication have at the population level, the average effect, but then I think we need to look into important subgroups. It could be individuals with certain comorbidities. We also need to look a little bit with regard to timing and duration. Is the effect the same for longer or shorter periods? Or could there be interesting differences there? The most important or one super important and critical aspect is, of course, confounding. And I think we will come back to that in the discussion. We need to be careful when it comes to time varying confounding. I have only talked about short term effects, the available evidence around long term effects of ADHD medication is quite limited. And that is one important goal for time span to advanced understanding of long-term effects when it comes to ADHD medication. I was planning to present shortly results from uh, three studies on substance abuse, depression, and school achievement. 
but I will not do that. So you will see here, oh, it looks quite good. And then just highlight that in Sweden, we are quite excited because we uh, will have new data available soon so that we can study really long-term effects. And what we are here, I mean, within time span, we have unique opportunities to really advance the understanding of the safety and effect effectiveness of ADHD medication. And I've highlighted uh, a couple of key ingredients of time span that, that I think are super important. I mean, this is, this is a really, really useful one. I mean, we have partners from several different countries, completely different healthcare systems, different types of data, careful comparisons across countries open up uh, unique possibilities to study uh, the impact of ADHD medication in the co in context of cardiometabolic disease. I think Harold, uh, you highlighted triangulation, and I think that is I mean that is a key concept within time span, and I think one super elegant but quite rare situation is that we in time span we have both register data or prescription databases, but we also have remote measurement technology. Uh, completely different type of data, but we could address similar questions using these two very different uh, data collections. Transparent reporting and pre-registration is other favorite topics of mine that you will uh, hear a lot uh, about uh, during this meeting, but also in the future. I think we, it's important that we move in that direction. One more minute. When you publish about ADHD medication, uh, people read your papers and they might uh, criticize you and have, uh, I mean, quite strong opinions about what you what you can actually say about pharmacoepi research. So this is a really helpful and useful commentary by Edmund Sanoga Bark, who was criticizing Seng's paper in biological psychiatry. And I mean, it, it's, it's tough, it's part of life. Uh, it's tough, but part of life. And I think all comments provided by Edmund make sense and are critical aspects that we need to think carefully about when we use observational data to address these important questions.